In the previous video, we finished the first half of the first part, covering Temujin's Genghis Khan early life, his rise to be the chief of the Kiet clan, and his quest for revenge for his father. If you haven't seen it yet, you're welcome to click the link to enjoy it. Next, we will discuss the second half of the first part, which covers the struggle of Temujin with Jamuka and Wong Khan leading to his coronation. As Genghis Khan, stay tuned for the exciting content ahead. In the spring breeze of 1200, Temujin and Wong Khan joined forces to launch an attack on the Taichia tribe. They triumphed in the battle north of the Honan River, killing Togatai. Without losing momentum, they continued their march towards what is now known as the Hulan Boar. Grasslands. Here, tribes such as the Konkoli, Sanjit, Duabai, Tota, and Hongjila resided. This time, their military campaign was even more formidable. And they seized a large number of tribespeople and livestock. Temujin's army swept across the land like a storm, unstoppable. His power and reputation grew with each victory in these battles. His prestige and power were further consolidated. With every war won, his troops grew stronger and braver with each fight, becoming a force on the Mongolian plateau that could not be ignored. Beneath the tranquility of the grasslands lay intense contradictions and conflicts as Temujin's power grew. Other nobles on the grasslands were filled with fear. They chose to oppose Temujin and elected Jamuka as Gakon, implying he was the leader of all kinds. In 1201, this latent conflict finally erupted. Jamuka combined the Tatars, Hongjila, Kankolis, and 11 other tribes to form a powerful coalition and launched an attack on Temujin. Their armies clashed with Temujin's troops on the banks of the Telon River, a tributary of the Karolon River, before the smoke of the Battle of Telon River could clear. Temujin's Mongol army emerged victorious, with unmatched courage and determination. They defeated the coalition, further proving Temujin's strategic wisdom and the bravery of his troops. This victory elevated Temujin's prestige to new heights, his power growing daily, unmatched by anyone. In the autumn of 1202, tensions were high on the Mongolian plateau, and a major battle known as the Battle of Khoetan was about to erupt, initially. It was merely a conflict between Naaman chieftain, Naaman Khan and Merkit chieftain Toktoa against the Karaites. However, with the remnants of the Taichiat, Duabai, Konkoli, Salagat, Tatar, and other tribes joining in, the battle quickly escalated, forcing Temujin and Wong Khan to unite against them. In the early stages of the war, the allied forces of Wong Khan and Temujin did not gain the upper hand. They retreated from the Yalusin River to inside the Great Wall. With Ringel as their line of defense, the Naaman coalition, like a pack of wolves, pursued relentlessly. Temujin sent Alton, Hakata, and Deratoi as vanguards. At the same time, Wong Khan sent Sankum, Johai Ganu, and Bilge Becky as vanguards. The two sides engaged in a battle of life and death at Koyatan. However, the outcome of the war exceeded everyone's expectations. The Naaman coalition suffered a devastating defeat in the decisive battle, seeing the tide of battle turn against him. Jamuka fled without fighting, retreating downstream of the Aguna River setting fire and looting along the way, leaving smoke everywhere. Wong Kong's army pursued relentlessly, finally defeating Jamuka on the banks of the Aguna River, forcing him to surrender. Next, Temujin's army swiftly advanced towards the Tatar tribe in the land of Dolonimages. On the eve of this battle, Temujin stood on the Mongolian plateau, facing his soldiers, and issued his Tejasas. These were the first laws he had enacted for his people. Since becoming the leader of the alliance of great historical significance, the first Jesseg stipulated that after a victory, soldiers should not greedily loot property, or spoils of war would be evenly distributed afterward. The second one stated that during battle, if any horsemen retreat to their original formation, they must immediately return to the battlefield, and those who violate this rule will receive the severest punishment, decapitation. These Tejasas aimed to enhance the Khan's power, restrict the actions of the nobility, and consolidate his position. However, in the subsequent battles, many Kiet nobles violated these Tejasas, 
Temujin did not hesitate to send his subordinate Noku to enforce strict punishment. Under Temujin's rule, whether noble or commoner, everyone had to obey his laws, or they would be punished. Temujin led his Mongol warriors in pursuit of the Taichia tribe. However, in the fierce battle, Temujin was unfortunately hit by an arrow in the neck and was critically injured. The battlefield, time was as precious as life at this time. His loyal warrior Zerubar sucked out the clotted blood for him and stole some yogurt, miraculously saving Temujin's life. As the sun rose the next morning, the soldiers of the Taichiad tribe emerged from their tents and surrendered to Temujin. The fall of the Taichiad tribe paved the way for Temujin to unify the various tribes of Mongolia. The generals of the Taichiad tribe, such as the Archajib and Naya, also became powerful aides in Temujin's conquest of the world. After a long period of war and conflict, Jamuka's power finally declined, the winds of change swept across the Mongolian plateau, eventually leading to a situation where the east and west became the two dominant powers. The land in the east, stretching from the Hunan River to the Greater Kingan Range, fell under Temujin's rule. This vast grassland flourished anew due to Temujin's unification. His army crisscrossed this land, establishing a robust line of defense, while also sowing the seeds of peace and unity among the tribes. On the other hand, the land in the west, stretching from the Hunan River to the Altai Mountains, was controlled by Wong Khan. His domain spanned the vast western part of the Mongolian plateau, forming a stark contrast with Temujin. Wong Khan's army was stationed on this grassland, closely monitoring the situation in the east, ready to respond to challenges from Temujin. For many years, Temujin had faithfully obeyed Wong Khan. He followed Wong Khan in expeditions east and west, cunningly using the power of the Karaites to enhance his own strength. He eliminated the hostile nobles within Mongolia and wiped out the major tribes in the eastern region, growing his power day by day. However, as Temujin's power grew, Wong Khan and his son Sankan began to harbor suspicions about him. They feared that Temujin's rise would threaten their position and began to look for opportunities to weaken his power. At the same time, Jamuka and other Mongolian nobles also began to persuade Wong Khan, hoping that he could eliminate this threatening individual. This situation of divided rule made the situation on the Mongolian plateau even more complex. Although a temporary peace had descended, everyone knew that this was just the calm before the storm, and the upcoming conflicts and wars would be even more fierce. In the spring of 1203, Temujin fell victim to a plot by Wong Khan and his son. They pretended to agree to Temujin's request to Betroth, his eldest son Joki to Yasuge's daughter, and invited him to a betrothal feast, planning to assassinate him at the banquet. However, Temujin received a secret report and promptly organized his army for defense. However, Temujin's forces were insufficient and he failed in the battle at Kurlan River against the Tatars, resulting in his troops scattering. He retreated to Mount Burkhan Holden by the Karolan River and regrouped his defeated army, left with only 4,600 cavalrymen. He then moved to the banks of the Banju River for rest and reorganization. During this extremely difficult period, Temujin and his followers lived under harsh conditions hunting horses for food and drinking murky river water. In these dire circumstances, Temujin raised his hand and swore to the sky that if he could complete his great task, he would share the joys and sorrows with his men. He said if he broke this oath, it would flow away like the river. The proud Wong Khan sat on his throne, the dazzling candlelight casting splendid shadows on his decked up face. He was relishing the taste of victory alone unaware that Temujin was secretly watching his every move. Temujin's vitality was gradually recovering, and he was planning his next move while watching Wong Khan's feast on Mount Shirit in the distance. Temujin, he said to himself, this is the moment when opportunity comes, so, on a moonlit night, he led his elite troops quietly towards Wong Khan's camp, ready to launch a surprise attack. The battle lasted for three days and nights, and in the end, Wong Khan's main forces were defeated, and he himself fled in disgrace. Wong Khan fled to the land of the Naaman tribe, 
Full of fear and hardship, however, his fate was sealed. He was killed by a border general of the Naaman tribe. His son Yelu Chikai met the same fate. He was expelled from Western Jir, then drifted to Kutcha, where he was ultimately killed by the locals under Temujin's leadership. All the people of the Karaites tribe were incorporated into his tribe. All the tribes from the Greater Kingan Range in the east to the Hangai Mountains in the west were completely conquered by him. At this point, his empire had been essentially established. The news of the fall of the Karaites tribe shook the rulers of the Naaman tribe like a thunderbolt. The Naaman Khan, a confident leader, his eyes full of a desire for victory, decided in 1204 to launch an attack on Mongolia and tried to connect with the Ongad tribe in the south. However, his plan failed and instead, the intelligence was handed over to Temujin. Temujin looked at the intelligence in his hand, his eyes firm, and the resolution in his heart had been formed. He assembled his horses by the Carolan River, organized them into units of thousands, hundreds and tens, appointed Noyan at all levels, and established a guard army. He led his army up the Kurlan River, marching westward, and set up his formation at the Surrey River. The Naaman Khan was not idle either. In addition to commanding his own troops, he also gathered a group of Mongolian and Karak nobles who had scattered after defeat as well as troops from the Merkit and Oirad tribes. However, despite their large numbers, his army was like a scattered sand, full of internal conflicts, coupled with the Naaman Khan's own incompetence. His army appeared extremely fragile in the face of a strong enemy. When the two armies met at Mount Nohukuntu, east of the Vulkan River, Jamuka and others were taken aback by the grandeur of Temujin's army and chose to abandon the Naaman Khan who was then defeated. Naaman Khan was injured in the battle and captured. Dying soon after, his son Kuklik fled west with the remnants of the tribe, seeking refuge with his uncle Baruch Khan. Temujin pursued the victory, advancing directly into the Altai Mountains and conquering the Naaman tribe. Jemuka had fled to the Tanu Mountains by this time, but was eventually captured by the five Noyans who followed him and brought before Temujin. Ending his life, like a storm, Temujin's cavalry charged northwards, directly striking the Merkit tribe. Their leader Turul, panicked at the sight, fled to Baruch Khan of the Naaman tribe. But this action did not change the fate of the Merkit tribe. Temujin's cavalry, like a tiger descending the mountain, swiftly occupied the territory of the Merkit tribe, incorporating it into his own. Then, in the spring of 1206, Temujin led his army across Kaltai Mountains into the region of Yurt. Of the Naaman's northern territory, this time his target was Bairuk Khan. Bairuk Khan was hunting on the Sogo River at the time, unprepared for Temujin's attack. He was caught off guard by the sudden attack of Temujin's army and was eventually captured by Temujin. With the northern part of the Naaman's territory also falling into his hands, these consecutive victories echoed Temujin's name across the Mongolian plateau and his empire continued to expand. However, the enemy had not been completely wiped out. As Kuklig and Tayan Khan had fled to the Burdish River after unifying the various tribes of the Mongolian plateau, Temujin held a large gathering at the source of the Gonan River in the spring of 1206, known as a Kuraltai. This gathering brought together the nobles of Mongolia, marking the beginning of a significant transformation. At the meeting, a shaman named Kakochu from the Wohuotan clan spoke authoritatively to Temujin. You have conquered all the kings known as Gurkhan, and their territories have become your land. Therefore, you should be given the title of Khan of all under heaven. This is the will of heaven, and your new title should be Genghis Khan, Temujin accepted this suggestion, and from then on, he was respectfully referred to as Genghis Khan by his kings and ministers. Genghis Khan established the Nine White Banners, using the name of his tribe as the name of the country, calling it Yik Mongol Elis, which in Mongolian means Great Mongol State. His family was also granted the honorable title of the Golden Family. After ascending the throne, Genghis Khan implemented a unified military political system known as the Thousand Household System, 
expanded the Central Army's protection force, the Keshik, and established a personal guard for the Great Khan. He also promulgated the Yasa, which is the world's first widely applied codified legal code. These reforms solidified the foundation of his empire and paved the way for his future conquests. In the next video, we will share the first part of the second episode where Genghis Khan, or Temujin, adopts a policy of appearing weak before becoming strong, leading to the conquest of the Western Jia and the destruction of the Jin Dynasty. Please stay tuned for the story in the next episode. If you like this story, please help us by subscribing and sharing. Thank you.